I'm not, I don't even dare look at the floor. These floors are great, by the way. They're not wood. They're the, I hate plastic, but they're that composition thing, and they're just, I can drop indie ink on it and get the indie ink off without any trouble at all, <laughs> fortunately. No, the easel is not going to stay in the don't living room. Me. You don't have to worry. Don't touch me. <laughs> I got it. <laughs> <laughs> it's rare that I have, uh, I mean, I could do anything on it. Uh, This makes a nice canvas from there to here. This one. I like working outside on a horizontal table because I literally can't see anything. I'm right there and I'm looking down. I'm this far from the work. There's not a chance in the world of being able to outsmart myself, you know and put in all the technique and whatnot or whatnot. I just have to paint. And because of that, stuff happens. And most all the universes are done there. And then later on the wall, but first there. Um, whereas this is a wall, this is different. Different things happen. How so? Hmm? How, how so? What, what, what is the, what's the difference between? Well, it's awareness here. I'm looking. I'm not seeing very much, but I have some control of what I'm doing. Whereas out there, the guts more than anything else. And if I'm thinking or thinking isn't the word because I don't think universe and then I try to picture it or anything like that. It's pretentious. You know, nobody can. I mean, it's a billion galaxies or a billion billion, you know. Get out of here. Um, and all because a couple of one cell things found out how to get together <laughs> and replicate. Yeah. And out of that very first replication, that's, that's what everything you see here. So out there, as I'm working, uh, it's really a considerable freedom of not looking. It sounds tripe or cheap or something, but it isn't at all. It takes away the biggest problem for me, which is my own judgment as to what I'm going to do next. Yeah, that comes in time, but not at that initial burst. I don't want to have anything to do with that. Of course, I can turn anything into anything anyway, uh, pretty much so after 40 some odd years of working probably eight, ten hours a day average, you get dandy. <laughs> Look at that baby. <laughs> at any given time, at Yeguas, at the Cortijo, we probably had, how many birds of prey do you think? Oh, well, it could be 20, 30 different ones. Some eagle owls, the giant eagle owls with six, seven foot wing spread and whatnot. One that had one eye, so I mean, he couldn't hunt or anything. He was free. He hung around my studio mostly. He loved the cavalletti. He loved my easel. And I'd be painting, and you'd hear these wings, and he'd land right on top of it. And then let go every once in a while when I'm painting, right? <laughs> these white streaks would appear down there. Barbie had just come back from the Pueblo, and we had a snake eating eagle who ate snakes, that's, you know, that's their thing. And, but he had a broken wing, so he couldn't fly. So he's in our patio, and so he has full use of that along with 20 peacocks, God knows how many cats, uh, and the various other stuff around. And so Barbie goes into the Pueblo, and I see her come into the driveway, and she's got this water snake like this. I hate snakes. I, I don't know, I'm afraid of snakes. It isn't that I hate them. You got the snake like this, right? And loves them. And comes in and then unwinds the snake. And the snake goes <laughs> right underneath a big tanaha. Those are 500 gallon oil jars, you know. Beautiful, beautiful. 
Tanaha that was outside in our patio. And the snake goes under there. The eagle smells the snake, and the eagle heads for there. And Impey just happened to be around the corner, and he comes over. And I have this picture, all like this, with the snake, <laughs> the eagle, Impey, everything, and the snake is under there. Like, oh, yeah, it's quite the menagerie there. Well, it's, it, we could share it after a while. There wasn't any such thing as legality and illegality and whatnot, and nobody gave a shit about animals, et cetera, et cetera. So we set up a, like you have here at ACES, uh, uh, recovery spot for animals. And the word got around, uh, and people who found injured animals, injured birds of prey mostly, but it turned out to be animals, boars, uh, what were some of the things that came up? Those tall oh, llamas, Siberian white tiger, a baby <laughs> pup. Oh no, <laughs> we had for about five months a wild boar. We used to chase the tiger around the, the <laughs> patio. Deer, um, fox, I mean, everything you couldn't mention. And they came up, anybody who was injured came up there, and uh, a lot of them recovered. Uh, that was a lot what Scott did, and also that fellow Wani I showed you there. He you know, we had five people working for us at the time. You can do that at a dollar a day, sort of, <laughs> two dollars. <laughs> it changes with time. And, uh, Anyway, they, we had all these things, and when uh, in 1980, museum, what year am I? 82, right after my, after the accident, after I went to New York to Georgetown Hospital, actually, the head of the hospital there, said, you got a problem, there's nothing we can do with it for it, and whatnot, there's no operation. And someday the muscle's just going to give out, and you're going to have a heart attack and whatnot, or you're going to fibrillate. But good diet, good, that's how I got to cook. Good diet, right? She's a wonderful cook. But stopping salt, forget about it, you know. I mean, salt tastes <laughs> good. <laughs> or <laughs> some fats are really good. And I, I figured I'd better get in the act. So for the first two years, I only could make a salad, and everybody eats salad. <laughs> and that. But after a while, it spread a little more. It's still plain Jane cooking. But. <laughs> Uh, and uh, so anyway, we started the museum in 83, the idea of the museum. And that was another for Cock to crazy idea like painting in the first place because who builds his own museum in the middle of nowhere? And we're 50 miles from anywhere. And uh, I was already on a tenuous thing with life, and I had a contract with the largest dealer in the United States and of art. And uh, it was due for renewal. And it was a guarantee, and Barbie loved the idea, and I hate the idea. And they used all my canvases. And the first thing we did, there was a show in New York, a one-man show that he was having. And while we were in there, I picked a big fight with him. I mean, a real big fight. And the only thing in my life I wanted to clear up is I didn't like my agent. Uh, I didn't like how they handled art and how they sold it and how they promoted it. But that goes for almost anybody. There's a, selling is selling, painting is painting, and never the two really meet. They're completely starving different things. Is starving. Hmm? starving is starving. Starving is starving too. So you got to sort of meh, work it out a little in between. Anyway, I picked a fight and we didn't renew and instead started a museum, which is going to cost a lot of money <laughs> and a lot of involvement. Now there's no income at all. <laughs> and uh, part of the museum actually turned out to be the, to bring the story around, the birds of prey and the animals. We had these huge, I won't call them cages because they were, well, they were taller than this here and they were 50 and 100 feet long and wire on the side so the birds could fly and be free within and whatnot. But if they went outside, they'd be attacked by other things or they couldn't feed themselves. So we needed them in. 